There is something very new, but also strangely traditional, about Roberto Alt's novel, Mad Toy, El Juguete Rabioso, written and set in 1920s Buenos Aires. The novel is new in that it sets out to depict Argentina's rapidly modernizing capital city, as it is transformed by mass migration and industrialization. Everything here is up for grabs, on sale in a maelstrom of social mobility in which almost anything is possible. The plot tells the story of its protagonist's trajectory as he tries to leave poverty behind and get ahead in life, driven both by his autodidactic enthusiasms and by his willingness to sell others out. But this story is also a traditional one, in that its structure and themes draw on the genre of the picaresque, as the tale of a mobile rogue who gives up a close-up view of the underbelly of a society in rapid transformation. The book acknowledges the past, but at the same time betrays it, as Alt outlines and enacts an affirmation of treachery, no longer as negation, but as the condition of possibility for the new to emerge. Alt's prose registers the multivocal cacophony of immigrant Buenos Aires, and his writing is infected by the linguistic mistakes and errors of the tumultuous contact zone. Alt takes up the mantle of bad writer, unscrupulous like his novel's anti-hero, Silvio Astier, but also irreverent towards the norms of what good writing should be. Mad Toy both pays homage to and tries to burn down the institution of literature, simultaneously returning to the idea of literature as an ever mobile, dynamic, mad toy of innovation and invention that cannot or should not be hamstrung by notions of fidelity or truth. Both the theme and the style of Alt's novel point to a venerable tradition in Spanish and Latin American letters, the picaresque, that is, a style of fiction dealing with the adventures of rogues, as critic Harry Sieber puts it, quoting the Oxford English Dictionary. The origins of the picaresque are almost coterminous with the origins of prose fiction in Spanish, going back at least as far as the anonymous Lazario de Tormes, of 1554. The Lazario established some of the conventions of the picaresque style, which are followed also by Mad Toy. For instance, that the tale is told in the first person by the picaro or rogue him, or less often her, self, and that the picaro's journey is defined by movement between social roles or professions, which involves him flitting from one master to another. Sieber again now quoting Frank Chandler, thus showing us the underside of the many institutions and spaces that comprise a particular social world. As Benedict Anderson puts it, in a comment on what is generally accepted to be the first novel written in Latin America, José Joaquín de Lizari's El Periquillo Saniento, The Mangy Parrot, published in Mexico in installments from 1816, the result is what he calls a picaresque tour d'horizon. If in colonial Mexico this encompasses hospitals, prisons, remote villages, monasteries, Indians, Negroes, in Alt's early 20th century Buenos Aires, the picaro's progress takes us variously through streets and schools, shops and markets, boarding houses and barracks, immersing us in a polyglot, a multi-accented babble that includes Andalusian Spanish, Italian, German and French, as well as Lunfado, the working-class slang of immigrant Argentina itself. So what then does this frenetic tour of the Argentine capital reveal? What does Mad Toy tell us about Buenos Aires at the outset of the 20th century? What is distinctive or different about the city? 
What challenges does it pose the protagonist? And how does he go about negotiating them? Pause the video here and write down some thoughts. While you do that, I'll have a glass of Malbec, but I'll be right back. Each chapter in Art's book is a new episode in its narrator's voyage of discovery and struggle for advancement. At the outset, Silvio Astier is 14 years old and still living at home with his mother and sister. The only mention of a father comes when we're told that he killed himself when Silvio was little. Inspired by reading tales of banditry and convinced that robbery was a noble and beautiful act, he forms a thieves' club with like-minded friends. Their first target is a school library, from which they steal both light bulbs and books, two different vehicles for enlightenment, keeping some of the more interesting volumes for themselves. For Silvio is a voracious reader of everything from technical scientific manuals to poetry, but above all of the pulp fiction adventures of characters such as Rocambole, from the pen of 19th century French writer Pierre Alexis Ponson du Terray. When, in the second chapter, at age 15, Silvio is told by his mother that he has to go out to work, she interrupts his reading to do so. Moreover, even she regrets her injunction, in that she is aware of her son's ambitions to move from reading to writing. I would so much rather that you had the time to write, she tells him. It is though she recognized that the literary forms through which he's viewing the world are out of date, inadequate, and that he might be the one to invent new ways to represent the world around them. As Silvio himself muses later in the same chapter, when he has tried to start a fire in the bookshop in which he's been working by throwing a lit coal into some papers. Who will paint the sleeping worker who smiles as he dreams because he's burnt down his master's den of thieves? Both his environment and his gleeful attitude towards the liveliness of its urban modernity the honking of automobile ho horns stretched out in a hoarse proclamation of joy, require new stories and new storytellers. It is this spirit of invention that carries Silvio to his next adventure, in which, now aged 16, he signs up with the armed forces against perhaps the typical image of the military as the site of regimentation and order, here it is portrayed as seeking new ideas and keen on experimental technology. Silvio prepares himself for his interview by thinking of the heroes in my favourite books, especially of Racambole, spurring me on to glib speech and a heroic pose. And he goes on to combine imitation and innovation as he outlines ideas for a signalling device for shooting stars and a typewriter that takes dictation, cosmic communication and mechanised writing. This goes down well enough with the officers at first, though on hearing of his literary interests they briefly worry about his politics. Say, this guy wouldn't be an anarchist, would he? But his undoing ultimately comes when a more senior commander determines that we don't need smart brutes here, just dumb brutes who can work. Thus the army, as well as Argentine society more broadly, stand accused of hypocrisy. For all their rhetoric of creativity and freedom, in practice all that matters is discipline 
and subjugation to an established hierarchy. In the book's final chapter then, Silvio cynically decides to play both sides, informing on a friend who had tried to persuade him to join in on a burglary. The homeowner, who would have been the victim of this criminality, is equal parts grateful and shocked that there should be such little honour among thieves. Why did you betray your friend? Aren't you ashamed to have so little dignity at your age? But Silvio tells him that any sense of regret is outweighed by a feeling of joy, a full, unconscious kind of joy. Refusing a monetary reward for his act of betrayal, he accepts instead the offer of a job in the south of the country, where there are glaciers and clouds and tall mountains. With that, the novel ends. The narrator has a new career in a new town, and perhaps has finally achieved the distance required to write the book that we have just read, a bildungsroman of the city, in its own Argentine idiom. Silvio justifies his betrayal of an erstwhile friend, indeed of somebody that he calls the finest man I've known, by thinking back once more to his literary models and heroes. The truth is, I had to confess, I'm a low-down scoundrel who's half crazy, but Rocambole was no less. He murdered people. I don't. He killed. Is there anyone he didn't betray? Such treachery is thereby reclaimed as positive and productive. The title of the book's final chapter is Judas Iscariot, and Silvio muses to himself, in part debating, but ultimately affirming the fate he is choosing. I'll be beautiful like Judas Iscariot. I'll carry a pain for the rest of my life. A pain. Despair will open my eyes to great spiritual horizons. And I'll bear a wound for the rest of my life, but... Ah, life is sweet. Then I'll be beautiful like Judas Iscariot. And I'll be in pain. In pain. Swine. Embracing betrayal is also an aestheticization of suffering. Pain is no longer to be avoided. The novel's clear-eyed realism suggests that this would be impossible in any case. But instead is to be accepted, perhaps even celebrated. Betrayal loses its negative connotations. As critic Ben Bollig comments, it becomes Astia's identity, a unique secret that sets Astier apart from others. Or rather, betrayal is what enables Art's protagonist to become something other than the roles to which he's otherwise apparently predestined. A loyal worker, or member of the criminalized underclass. It is betrayal that allows Silvio to construct his own destiny. Treachery is a generative force. Only by turning his back on past loyalties can he imagine alternative futures, or even a future at all. The Picaro has always been an untrustworthy, untrustworthy figure. He is literally shifty, mobile, volatile, refusing to be pinned down. He is never willing or able to settle, to accept his place in society. He either wants too much, too much freedom, too much autonomy, to be satisfied in any one place, or he bristles at the fact that too much, too much application, too much energy and devotion, is asked of him by the various would-be masters whose tutelage he tries and tests and forever finds wanting. He slips through the cracks, both of colonial order, in the case of Lissardi's Pedagio, and of post-colonial nation-building, with Alts Silvio Astier. The Picaresque constitutes a political critique of the institutions through which the Picaro passes, but is also an infrapolitical critique of the capacity of politics 
to solve the problems it reveals. There's no class solidarity here, no organized social protest. The Picaro is as likely to betray allies as enemies. The Argentine critic and writer Ricardo Piglia, whose novel Burnt Money is similarly concerned with treachery and betrayal among thieves, thieves who ultimately sacrifice even what their thievery has got them, simply because they can, points out that Alt's betrayal is literary or aesthetic, as much as it is political or even infrapolitical. Piglia sees Silvio's threat theft of books from the library and subsequent attempt to burn down the bookshop, not simply as an assault on institutions of the state on the one hand and commerce on the other, but also as an assault on the notion of literary taste. Moreover, he underlines the fact that Alt unabashedly owns up to the charge that he writes badly. It's said of me that I write badly. It's possible. Or, as Pelia has a character say of Alt in another of his novels, Artificial Respiration, the truth is that he wrote like shit. He wrote as if he wanted to make a mess of his life, to destroy his own prestige. No doubt he has one undeniable merit. It will be impossible to write worse. In that respect, he is unique and without rival. But it is not carelessness that accounts for Alt's errors, his mangling of language, grammar, syntax, and semantics. He wrote badly, but in the moral sense of the word. His is bad writing, perverse writing. His is a criminal style. He does what one is not supposed to do, what's wrong. He wrecks everything that for 50 years had been understood to be good writing in this pallid republic. He breaks the laws of proper writing, much as Silvio breaks the laws regarding property, as well as propriety. Alt steals from the literary tradition, as with his theft of elements of the picaresque, but he also turns his back on it, betrays it, gives it a figurative middle finger by opening up his text to the cacophonous demotic of the Buenos Aires streets. For Piglia, what we find in Alt is a proposal that a writer should be thief, traitor, inventor, poet maudit, who is beyond the good and beyond reason. Taking aim at the institutions of taste, education and commerce, that are fundamentally exclusionary, why do Silvio and his friends have to break into a library in the first place? Or that reduce everything by commodification to cost, value and profit? It is no accident that Silvio becomes a seller of paper. Alt puts a torch to the very notion of literature itself, in the hope that new forms of speaking and writing will emerge, reborn, from the flames. Yet Piglia also suggests that all literature is theft or betrayal. There is an echo here of the quip attributed to various modernist artists in different genres – T.S. Eliot, Pablo Picasso and Igor Stravinsky among others – that good artists copy, great artists steal. With Alt's patchwork of quotations and influences from writers consecrated and otherwise, both classics and pulp. In the double game of the cited texts, the story of the robbery, the story of Rocambole, text within text, story within story, the possibility of writing itself is born. In this sense, one would have to say that in this text, the mad toy is nothing other than literature. So, with his betrayal, Astier is simply doing literature. Inherent to the literary endeavour is betrayal, 
or even multiple betrayals. Larceny and theft from a cannon whose limits and enclosures have always to be overrun. But also investment in a project of misrepresentation that necessarily involves guile, illusion and deceit. Alt exposes and revels in the treachery of words, not least as found in the argot of immigrant Buenos Aires. A language in flux, under the pressure of new arrivals, and the new uses to which it is put to describe novel experiences, unheralded encounters, and their unanticipated consequences.